So what we've done so far is found a way of establishing electric field due to charge particles at a point and we started with one charge and then also found a way of calculating the field due to several charges using vector addition. So let us now put our learning of the previous lesson to find what will be the field due to a collection of charges spread over a thin solid surface like say a ring or a rod or maybe even an arc. So you clearly see that this is not just a collection of a few million or a billion charges but uh, it, it's a collection of charges spread over length of the rod or circumference of the ring and it is obvious that you cannot do vector addition for each particle to find the net force or the electric field the way we did for a measurably smaller number of charged particles earlier on in the last lesson. Well, then let us try to find a way that will help us find electric field due to such a cluster of charges. So let us consider a ring that has a positive charge Q on it and we will try to find the electric field at a point P above it and let's say P lies on the Z axis. Now, what is important here is that you try to understand how we are approaching this problem because if you do so, you will be able to apply this method to other patterns of line charges like an arc or a straight line as well. So focus more on the derivation than the final answer and when you get to the final answer, try to interpret the results in various ways uh, what will give you a let's say a better depth of understanding of the topic. So uh, a good start could be that we pick a very very small element of length ds here and say the charge on it is dq and considering ds is very small dq should also be very small. Then we can say that the charge per unit length is nothing but dq divided by ds and let us term this as lambda or uh, dq is equal to lambda times ds. Now this charge element what you see here is going to set up a certain electric field at p that uh, is at a distance r from the element and we can say that the small value of e set up here is de and this DE should equal 1 upon 4 pi epsilon DQ upon R square, which again can be written as 1 upon 4 pi epsilon lambda DS upon R square. But then this being a right angle triangle, uh, R square should equal Z square plus R square. So we can substitute the value of R square as this in the equation to get DE is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon lambda DS upon Z square plus capital R square. Now you see that we are lucky here that every DS element through the length of the circle is at the same distance from point P and would therefore contribute the same value of DE at P which is this. So it makes our calculations a little easier and we'll see that as we move forward. So let us now take an element of uh, length ds uh, right opposite this one and we can say that the line from uh, this element also to p uh, should lean at an angle theta and the direction of electric field would be this. Now if you take the vertical components of both these vectors you will see that they point in upward direction but if you take the horizontal component of each of these vectors you will see they project out in opposite directions and therefore cancel each other and you would see that by symmetry uh, any ds element you take on the circle will have its horizontal component of electric field cancelled by an equivalent ds element right opposite it. So what you end up having is only the vertical components as the net electric field at this point due to each element ds on this ring. So 
This also makes things easier for us. And further, all the vertical components are in positive Z direction. So uh, you could say that's also good. Now, the question is, how can we add up all the vertical components of the electric field by each element ds on this ring? And what we'll see is that um, integral calculus can help us in doing this summation. So the value of the vertical component is nothing but de cos theta. And if we take cos theta is equal to z upon r, we get cos theta equals uh, z upon r, which equals z upon z square plus r square under root. So we can write de cos theta as equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon z lambda upon z square plus r square to the power 3 by 2 ds. And using integral calculus, we sum up the contribution of each ds by integrating them from s starting at 0 all the way to s is equal to 2 pi r. So what we're doing here is using integral calculus to account for the electric field due to all charge elements, uh, dq on the ring, and summing them up. So we say that the total electric field is integral of dE cos theta, which is equal to z lambda upon 4 pi epsilon, z square plus r square to the power 3 by 2, integral of ds as it changes from 0 to 2 pi r. Now, if you integrate this, what you get is this expression. But then we can say that lambda can also be written as total charge on the ring divided by the total length. So lambda uh, can also be written as q upon 2 pi r because you see 2 pi r is the circumference of this uh, ring and q is the uh, the total charge on the ring. And if we substitute this value in this equation, what we get is this expression. So you can see that we have taken Q as a positive charge on the ring to do the derivation. But if we take it as a negative charge, E value would become negative, indicating that the direction of the field is downwards towards the ring instead of upwards that it is with a positive Q charge. Well, we could do some interesting checks with the formula we've just derived to see if it is really correct. So let us say that Z is much greater than R such that the square of Z would be a lot higher than square of R. So we can go ahead and drop the R square value and approximate Z square plus R square as z square only and then what we get is e is equal to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon q upon z square and you see that this expression corresponds to what would be the e value due to a point charge well this makes sense since at a very large distance the ring would actually look like a point object and therefore the E value would be the same as what you would get from a point charge, which is this. Well, we could also try to find what happens to E value if Z is zero. So instead of a very large Z value, we have just taken Z as zero. And when you put uh, Z is equal to zero, what we see is that E becomes zero. Well, this also seems logical since force due to any element of the ring will be canceled by the charge due to the element right opposite it. And if we get net force as zero, electric field also becomes zero. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and please do not forget to subscribe to this channel for many more interesting videos.